Welcome back to Barley and Hops, where we try to answer your questions as best we can, but we know we never get to all of them. So don't forget to comment below and let us know how we're doing or ask a question. Please share us with your friends, like us, uh, and always subscribe. Now, into what we're actually going to do today. We're going to make some rum. Um, and I've had a lot of questions about how do you make rum, and almost everybody knows that rum is made from molasses or pure cane sugar. Uh, but there's a process that that goes through, and then the, the majority of questions kind of focus into sulfured versus unsulfured. Well, the primary difference between the two is this. If you take a baby or a, an unripened cane, uh, and you're getting ready to run that through the process, then what they do is they put in sulfur dioxide. Uh, and that, while that really does, that's a preservative and it preserves that cane before it gets to its process so it doesn't deteriorate. But unsulfured molasses is molasses that's made from, and it's actually the most genuine and the most pure form of molasses, it's made from the sun-ripened cane. So that's really the primary difference. And does it have an effect? Well, for, for my opinion is, is that if I can use unsulfured molasses, I always will because I'm not quite sure or can I be confident that the amount of sulfur dioxide that's in the sulfured molasses will have any effect on my process. So it's up to you, but uh, unsulfured molasses is always best. So what we've got here, in order to make this, and I'm gonna do this the, the, the most simple way possible. I know that everybody out there doesn't have all the pieces of equipment that everybody else does, So, but most of us have the basics of what it requires to actually make a really, really good rum. And what I'm actually gonna do is, we're gonna, this, I'm starting this, because this is gonna be my coconut rum, but no, I'm not going to ferment any coconuts. Another topic all in itself, okay. What we've got is I've got nine pounds or 96 ounces, because three pounds is 32 ounces of unsulfured molasses. Uh, I'm going to use that. I've got four pounds of sugar in the raw. And the sugar in the raw, it has not been processed yet because the process in sugar is where you get the molasses. Do you know brown sugar? Uh, brown sugar is not fully processed, so you got a little bit of molasses in there. That's why it's brown. Um, and there's a lot of other things that's done to it. But, so we're gonna use raw sugar. Now these are the two primary ingredients. Uh, and of course we're gonna use some yeast energizer and we're gonna put some yeast in it. And I'll use the daddy yeast. Uh, you can use rum turbo yeast. Uh, it's made specifically for rum, so if you have it, why not? But if not, in a pinch, EC1118, it's a really good wine yeast will work. Um, your daddy yeast will work. A whiskey yeast will actually do a pretty darn good job, and it's really, really hard to tell the difference. So when it comes to making rum, you've got a little bit of leeway left and right on some of your ingredients and how you approach this, okay? Now, what I will not do, and this is for later on, after it's all fermented and ready to go, we'll go through that process. When we actually distill it is when we want to try to impart that coconut flavor. Now, now, before you ask the question and you write the comments, well, George, can't you just add the coconut? Look, you probably could. Um, but really, the, the best way to ask a question is, should I? Um, because if you say, can I, the answer is always, well, hell yeah. Um, but, you know, ask the question, should I? Should I has a big, different implication. Uh, you probably should not, because you're not trying to ferment a coconut. You're trying to ferment the base molasses and the raw sugar in order to get that rum flavor. And then we're going to impart the coconut at the end process, uh, just like the stillers do. Now, we have three options. And those three options are, I can add coconut, pure raw coconut milk to the distilling kettle and try to get some flavor out that way. That's one good way of doing it, but it doesn't necessarily impart all the flavors that we're looking for. What I also could do is I could use some coconut flakes, just regular flake coconuts you find in the bakery aisle. Um, I would use probably both of these bags for one run, uh, and I would put those in, a, see now here's the option, because not everybody has all of those pieces of equipment. We've got a gin still with a gin basket in the middle and we'd fill that gin basket 
just like we would putting any, like if you're gonna make gin, you put juniper berries in there and you distill through it, which gives you a lot more of that aroma and that flavor. And we could probably do that. Um, you could also, if you have a two inch column, you could use, you know, an old sock, not, not one of your old socks. I'm talking about, you know, there's like a, a, a hop sock that you would get for, for beer. And it's just a muslin sock. And you could fill that up with a coconut and then drop it down inside, put a little string on it. And then when you put your bung on top, it'll hold that in the middle of your column and you distill through it. So remember, distilling through a medium gives you the best flavor and the more robust aroma, flavor, you know, all those things that you're actually looking for. It's, as an example, if you used coffee and you crush a couple of coffee beans and put them in, in the column, you get a really good coffee liquor out of that. Okay, now the last option we have, um, and this is probably one that's most direct and it's, it's really easy and it's very, very good as well, is coconut extract. Uh, and you'd add that to the distillate after you're finished. Um, the benefit of using an extract is that you don't have to wait until it's all finished and then taste it and go, wow, that's got a lot of great coconut, or hey, I wish I had just a little bit more. Well, see, with the extract, you can add it until it meets your requirement. So, you know, you can add a little bit and then taste it and add a little bit more, taste it, and go, oh, okay, that's, that's enough. So that's the other options you have. So without, what we're going to do now is we're going to mix all this up. I have... This is the only thing that I'm going to use that's not normally available in your kitchen or your garage. And that's one of them, it's a, it's a paint mixer. Uh, it's just a great big wheel and I put it on the end of a drill. And this is really good for stirring and mixing. Uh, but you could use a paddle. That's, that's absolutely fine. Or you could use a great big whisk. The other thing I'm going to do is we're going to test the pH. Because the pH of any time that you're going to do a fermentation for distillation should be around 5.2. That's, that, that's, that is that window of excellence is 5.2. And remember, your pH scale goes from 1 to 14, 7 being neutral. So it's, it's kind of weird, but okay. 1 through 7 is acidic. 7 through 14 is alkaline. So what you want now, you have 7.2, 7.6, somewhere around there is normally what tap water is. It's not really acidic at all, and it's not strongly alkaline. So, but what we want, we want a little bit of acidity in here. So I'm gonna use these, this is HTH. You don't have to use this brand. You get them at Walmart, but you use them to test the pool. But just look on the back and make sure that on the back, it at least goes down. This one only goes down to 6.4. Um, and you'll know, Acetosis will give you a general idea if you're in the right ballpark and you know instead of just trying to guess that I'm at 7.2 or where, where am I at I'm trying to get to 5.2 so I want to be a little bit more acidic uh, I'm going to use those just as a demonstration because it's really the most direct and most inexpensive way of going about it or you can get a pH meter and that's what one of these are you put the, the end of it off turn it on and stick it in there and then you'll read the scale it'll tell you what the pH is so we're going to do both of those just to check the pH of our water before we make our mash. And remember, anytime you add ingredients to the water, your pH will change. But if the, your starting point should be 5.2. Now, there's one last thing that you could use if uh, you're trying to balance the pH in your water. There's a, um, there's a product known as pH stabilizer. It's called 5.2. I guess it's called 5.2 because that's what we're all, that's what the goal is. But you can get it at most of your local brew shops. Or you can get it at barleyandhopsbrewing.com. Just, or call Ray. Ray, Ray. Ray's got it right on the shelf now. 254-300-8226. Uh, for all your brewing needs. Now, uh, you could use that and that'll balance your pH uh, for, regardless of what you're trying to make. Okay. And, and also, it'll go, whether it's high, it'll bring it down. If it's low, it'll bring it up. So pH balancer, it's called 5.2. Now, I already know that in general that my tap water, which I like to use because our tap water tastes really good. Um, I already know that it's probably in the 7, 7.4 range. I already know that. So what I've done is, and you know, the question is, well, well how, do you, how do you adjust that if necessary? Well, there's a whole lot of uh, potassium bicarbonate. I mean, there's, there's all these great and crazy wonderful things, because and all of them do the same thing. They'll adjust the pH of your water. A real easy way to acidify your water is by adding some 
acid, something that's more natural, like a lemon. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some lemon, you know, take, cut it open, squeeze it, squeeze a lemon in there, and then we're gonna test it again until we get to the proper pH level. And if I don't have enough acid in one lemon, I'm gonna actually use just a jug of lemon juice. Just squeeze it in there until I get to the right pH level, okay? So you with me so far? Good. What we're gonna do is we're gonna mix, we're, we're gonna test first, we're gonna balance, then we're gonna mix, and we're gonna test to see where it's at. Then we're gonna add our yeast nutrient and our yeast. And this time I think what we'll do is I think we'll, we'll do a pre-proof on our yeast and just let it grow a little bit. And then we're gonna put the lid on it and we're gonna let it ferment. After all that's said and done, we'll come back because this will take seven to 10 days, just like normal. And then we'll transfer it, we'll check it out, and then we'll clarify it. And then we're gonna put it in the pot and then we're gonna purify it. So we'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes as I get all this stuff all ready and set and you can watch us go through the process. All righty now. We got a cup here, this is not coffee. I just dipped in and grabbed some water out of there. So I wanna test the water. I don't have to test it, I can just test it here. And the first thing I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use my pH meter and I'll get close to the camera so you can see this. I'll turn it on and it'll balance itself out. And you'll see that the numbers will bounce up and down all around, do all kind of crazy things. And then when you dip it in the water, 6.9, 7.9, 8.9, so I'm just about seven, it's 6.9. And so I'm a little bit on the acidic side, just a little bit. Now let's use one of these test strips from our local pool supplier or Walmart or wherever you tend to buy these. And, or you can get them from a brew shop uh, and some of them will go all the way down to five. Um, they, they make them for wine and or beer uh, because you're looking for different pH levels in wine in particular in a, like a finished product looking for a different pH level. All right so with this one all we do is we drop it in get it wet and pull it right back out. Whoops yeah that was a good move and then we turn it over on the back and we use the back panel and we set this aside and we just all we do is we compare the colors and if you'll see that second one from the top you got the top one and the second one is turning orange. If we go down here and try to match it, I'm uh, matching it somewhere around a 6.8 to a 7.3. It just gives me a range. And so I've kind of verified that my meter's actually working right or the meter's verified that the strip's working right. But what we want to try to do is we'll try to bring it down. We, we want to bring that down so we will make it a little bit more acidic. Let's do this. Let's cut this lemon. And you know, you really don't have to worry about the, the seed. If the seed drops in there, big deal. You're gonna, you're gonna clear it anyway. Um, you're gonna have a lot of sediment in this fermentation, so you're gonna clear it anyway. So let's do this, let's... Yeah. Okay. And I'll put some more, put the other half of that lemon in there. And before someone asks a question, because I know they will, hey, George, can you just throw the lemon in there and let it stay? Remember what I said? Could I or should I? You can. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, I guess you could. All right. Now, let's give it a stir. It doesn't take much. Oh well, yeah, get a new, yep, get a new cup of that water. Let's turn our pH meter back on. And you'll see, see it bouncing around? It'll bounce around until I put it in. And I'll put it in. You see it going down? 6.6, 6.5, 6.4. We got a little ways to go. So. I'm going to use some of that lemon juice that I brought over. And, and I put that back in there. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to add some lemon juice and try to get ourselves to the proper level. That should not take a whole lot. 
Now, there are probably measurements of this stuff, but you notice I like to work with my hands and with all my senses. You know, I know if a little bit does, I just a little bit more. A little bit, I like to work my way towards it. Um, there are things that are really good to just measure ahead of time if you know precisely what you're, what you're looking for. But in this particular case, just keep adding until you get to where you want. Okay, she's starting to bounce around. There it goes, going back up and down. 5.97, 6, 5.5. Looks like it's going to stay there at 5.5. So we, you know that we're actually adjusting the pH of this water. Um, with that said, knowing that I brought it down from, what, 6.4 to 5.5 with a squirt, whoops, I would imagine that that squirt is going to probably do it. This is an amazing process. And most of this is just so simple. Um, please, don't make it any harder than it is. Don't, don't overthink it. Here we go. One more time, there's, it's, see it's bouncing around, going back up and down. We put it in, 5.2, there we go. We have balanced it out now. Our pH level of this water is 5.2. So now it's time, the only thing we got left to do is add all of our ingredients, which I'm gonna do slowly, and then uh, we'll mix it. And at the very end, we'll do the final yeast nutrient and yeast and we'll get on with it. So we'll be back with you. Let me get this ready and uh, we'll pick up where I left off, okay? All right, yeah, we got four pounds of the uh, raw sugar. Uh, this one is sugar in the raw. It's a four pound bag. And in, in most of your grocery stores, you're gonna find raw sugar. Uh, you'll also find coconut sugar. Um, here we go. <laughs> can I use coconut sugar? What? Yeah, you can use it, but should you? Never tried it. Give it a try at home and let us know what you find out. All right, and you'll see that this stuff is, uh, it's nice and, it's got some big uh, crystals and it's brownish. So we're gonna add that slowly. And at the same time that we're doing that, we're going to, and we're doing the sugar first only because it's crystals and we wanna liquefy it. So we're gonna add that first. And uh, we're gonna let that liquefy. That may take a few minutes, but, Whoops. Well, yeah, I just dumped the whole bag in there. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, I would have preferred to do it a little slower. So, there we go. And uh, this will mix all that up. And I've got a really nice amber color here. We'll show you that in a second. As we mix it up. Look, you go take a break, and I'm going to do the mixing on here, and I'll be back. Well, we've got this all mixed up. I want to show you this. Um, now, this is only the, the uh, raw sugar. Uh, you'll see it's got that really nice amber color. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to add uh, all of our molasses uh, before we take a gravity reading. And I've already got, you'll see here, I've already got my starter going. Uh, that's my yeast starter. And that should take all 10, 15 minutes or so. Or maybe even a little bit more. And we're going to add this in a very slow manner, but at the same time, we're gonna be mixing, because uh, this is pretty thick stuff, you'll see that. And that really starts to turn it a dark color. Now remember, this will come out crystal clear in the still, so it doesn't matter what color uh, your wash winds up being, uh, it's gonna come out clear. Now, I want to give you a tip while we're at this, because this is going to take me a little while as well. Uh, I'll get all three of these mixed in here. But when it comes to cleaning out your buckets or your utensils or the things that you're going to use, um, I'll share this with you. The best thing uh, to use, of course, is going to be a really light soap, light, mild, warm soap. Light, mild, warm, soapy water. Yeah. And uh, the best thing to use are these, your hands, uh, because you can feel and as you wash, there's no way you can scratch anything. So you can't scratch the inside of your bucket to give bacteria a place to live. Uh, but at the same token, when you're going around in there, you'll feel if you've got any crust or any hard spots in there. Plus, it's a really good clean uh, surface is your hands. 
An old Chinese guy told me that years ago when I was working as a dishwasher, he t told me silverware, the best way to wash silverware is with your fingers because you can feel if you get it all off. So keep that in mind. All right, we're going to go back to mixing this, and uh, we'll be back with you as, uh, soon as, as soon as we get that done. It should take me five, ten minutes. I wanted to show you this. Uh, it, I'm not sure if you can see it or not. But uh, there's a lot of ag. This is the yeast that's that's just proofing. You see, it's starting to develop a head on the top. It's been 10 minutes, but I was just watching it, and there is so much activity going on. And there's like little volcanoes that are taking off. that's going up. So this is really fun to watch. This is actually what happens in your fermenter. Uh, yeah, you can see it, see it there moving around. In your fermenter, there's a lot of yeast activity taking place, and so this stuff is really going at it. I just wanted to show you that. Now, one, one other thing I do is, you'll know that the molasses is really hard to get out of these jugs, or, or any kind of jug that you have, because it's, it's really thick. So what you do is, when you get a couple of empty ones, you, you fill it halfway with warm water, and you fill the other one halfway with warm water, and you start pouring them back and forth. Uh, and that way you can leach out all that remaining uh, molasses and sort of like clean that jug out and take advantage of everything you've got there, because there's no sense in wasting any of it. There, you'll see that that's pretty clear and clean on the inside. Just pour that in there. So, now, in my bucket, I have mm, probably a good six gallons. Uh, and I didn't measure that precisely. I, I kind of have this visual of what I want to see. And the reason I do that is even though I want to make a five-gallon batch, you know what's going to take place is going to ferment, and then everything's going to drop to the bottom. Well, when I start to siphon that off, or if I use, you know, check out our video for uh, vacuum transfers. When I transfer, whether it's vacuum or whether it's a pump or however I do a siphon, uh, I, I like to stay off the bottom be because I don't want to pick up any of that sediment. I'm trying to separate that sediment from the wash. So I'll make a little bit extra because I know I'm always going to sacrifice some. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can go all the way down to the bottom and you can try to tilt it and whatever you want to do, try to get every bit of it. Uh, and that's quite all right. But uh, I'll, I like to just, I'll, I'll sacrifice, yeah, maybe a quart or two, maybe sometimes, uh, during a transfer just in order to get as clear a mash as I can. Because remember, the cleaner it goes in, by golly, the cleaner it comes out. You know, as I always say, man, never take a sleeping pill and a laxative at the same time, huh? Yeah, the future is easy to predict, but absolutely impossible to control. So you don't want to put a dirty wash into your still because you're going to wind up scorching and getting some dirty stuff coming out. All right, let's let's keep going. I've got all this in here now, and I'm going to do some more mixing just to make sure that I'm fully mixed up. And um, here in a few minutes, we're going to add, oh yeah. We're going to add some yeast nutrient, and then we're going to add some yeast and put a top on it. This, my friends, should make us happy. Be right back. All right. Hey, you know, we've got it all mixed. Um, we're, we're just about ready to go. As a matter of fact, I was just making sure I was using that star sand mix that uh, we have for anything that touches uh, your mash. Cleanliness and sanitation is very important, but when it comes to a mash, it's not critical. Uh, and let me try to explain the difference. You know, when you make it beer, uh, you're not going to distill it, so it's critical. When you're making wine, it is critical, you know. Uh, but when you're making a mash, it's not critical, but it's still important. So make sure you're using Star Sand. That's that little sanitizer that we use, and it's like, wow, like an, an ounce per three or four gallons. Uh, and it'll stay good as long as you put it in a spray bottle and cover it. If you leave it open, uh, it'll dissipate, it'll, it'll leave, uh, and it'll become non-effective after about two days. So if you put it in a bucket and you think you're saving it, uh, unless you put a lid on the bucket and keep it there, that it's going to go away. So, but this stuff, I've had this bottle for, and you can imagine how much I go through, but I've had this bottle for over two years. So this stuff will last you a long, long time. And uh, it's actually, what's really good about it, it's a spray, shake, and then use. They, whereas with if you're going to use Clorox bleach or uh, some of those other chemicals uh, for sanitation, you've got contact time. Uh, bleach is about 20 minutes, and then you got to rinse all of that out. And so, but with this, it's just a spray shake, and you can use. So, excellent product. All right, 
Well, here's what we've got now. We're, we're getting ready to add everything else to it, but what have we forgotten? We got nine pounds of uh, molasses. Uh, we got four pounds of the raw sugar. We, we've done all of that. Uh, we managed. To, we've, we've checked our uh, pH. Everything was fine. Uh, now we got to take a gravity reading. Remember, always take a gravity reading before you add the yeast. Uh, if you ever call and you have an issue, the, the first question we'll probably ask you is, well, what was your initial gravity? And you would believe the number of times I get, well, uh, I forgot. That, that's okay. It's not, it's not the end of the world. But it's important because if you have a data point at the beginning and then we have a data point now, that can kind of tell us where we're at and, and where we're going or if we're going anywhere at all. So I've pulled out a sample. And we're going to drop our hydrometer. Any predictions? And you'll see here, we are, let me see if I can get that focused in for you real good. We're at like 1.080, which really is going to bring us to about almost an 11% uh, potential alcohol by volume. So what that's telling me is that when I am completed the fermentation problem pro process and then the distillation process, that about 11% of that bucket is going to be pure ethyl alcohol. So I should probably wind up with doggone near a gallon, give or take. Uh, and then when I cut that, because it'll start off at like 170 and it'll start to precipitously drop. And then I cut that, I'll probably wind up with about six, maybe seven quarts of some really terrific rum. All right. Now you can use diammonium phosphate, big word for me. Uh, diammonium phosphate is an additive and you'll get that at your local brew store. Uh, now I also use, I love using this, a Firmax yeast nutrient. Firmax yeast nutrient comes in a small pouch or you can get a one pound bag. Uh, if you're gonna get um, the distiller's active dry yeast, daddy yeast, uh, it, that come, it's easy to get it in a one pound block, it's less than 20 bucks. Uh, and then you get two pounds of this because it goes, it's two to one ratio. Two scoops of Firmax yeast nutrient and one scoop of uh, yeast is a batch. For, it's good for about five gallons. I'm talking about a good heaping tablespoon. And then um, you can make probably 48 to 52 batches with that one pound of uh, daddy yeast. So I've done that and you'll see that I've, let's, while we're here, let's test the uh, pH of the finished product and see where it is at. Where did I put that cup? There it is. And I'm sure everybody's kind of curious because we know it's going to change or maybe it won't. So I'll turn the pH meter on and again you'll see it bouncing all over the place. I'm going to stick it in there. Look at that. It's 5.8 it's about a 5.8, so you'll see it raised itself, 5.9. So it's absorbing a bit of that acidity, uh, but it started out good, so let's rinse that off. We're in good shape. Now, here you go, 20 minutes. And we've got a cake on top of this yeast, and you can see it is still moving around in there, so it's very, very active. Uh, the last thing I got to do now is just, we call it pitching the yeast. I'll pitch the yeast and then we'll, of course, add the lid and an airlock. It will keep that at, the temperature we're looking for is anywhere from 68 to about 74 degrees. Uh, here's what will happen. <clears throat> if you get it too cold, your yeast will go along really, really slow and sluggish, and they may even stop. Uh, now, if you start moving up that ladder of temperature above 74, you get around 78, you'll start to get some really robust activity. Uh, now, here's the trade-off of that robust activity is the side odor that sometimes is associated with it. When you get up into the 80s and the low 90s, uh, you're going to have a stench. It smells like... First of all, it smells like ass, and then uh, and your wife ain't gonna be happy with that. And if you get it too warm, it'll smell like two asses, and uh, she'll be running you out of the house with it. 
but uh, it, it's like rotten eggs. The, the, really, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just the off odors that that chemical um, reaction that's taking place inside there is going to give off. Now, when you're doing a beer or a wine, if you get that kind of smell, you may have some issues with flavor. But uh, when it comes to uh, distilling, uh, remember, you're going to put it through a pot and you're going to raise that temperature high enough to kill off anything that's bad uh, and produce a clear product, product on the end. So uh, the smell of the fermentation problem process doesn't have as much effect on that flavor. Uh, just be cautious uh, and don't let it get too warm. Now, if it gets really, really hot, uh, about 110 degrees or more, uh, which is astronomical by anybody's measure, uh, you may kill that yeast. Now remember, when you put the yeast in there, it's the, the temperature of your mash overnight is going to rise probably three to four degrees due to the activity of the yeast going on inside. So I like to keep it around 74-ish, somewhere around there, and um, you should get some really good results. If it goes up to 80, 85, I, I, I usually don't really worry about it. I put it out here in the man cave where uh, you can't smell that mass is inside. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to just, all I'm going to do is just pour this in here because it is ready to do its thing. And while that's in there, we're going to, and see, I don't, I don't even have to mix it. I'm going to put the lid on in such a manner that when I pull the handle up, it doesn't get interfered with my air lock. Last but not least, I put the air lock on there and I'm going to mark it. And I'll also write on the side of it what the original gravity was. Remember that? 1.080. So I got about a 10 and a half, 11% uh, potential alcohol by volume. There you have it. And then when we come back and we do this later, we'll distill it. And we'll distill it in as many different methods as we possibly can. Because uh, we've only got one batch here. Uh, but we'll try to go through the coconut uh, in the column. And then we'll also try it with uh, some of the uh, imitation uh, coconut extract. Uh, we're going to make a coconut rum, whether, whether you like it or not. So, please, hang with us, and as always, happy distilling.